Welcome to the Parker Avery Group's Talk Retail to Me podcast and new for 2023 video series. In each episode, our consulting professionals cover key retail and CPG topics and offer pragmatic insights that will add value to your operations and initiatives. This episode of Talk Retail to Me focuses on business process transformation. Featuring two of our retail leaders, Clay Parnell and Deanna Emsley, we take a deep dive into what it means to transform business processes. We'll cover what areas are focus points for our clients, how we help retailers and consumer brands prioritize and navigate these process transformation, and what success looks like. We hope you enjoy this episode of Talk Retail to Me. Welcome. Let's jump right in, okay. Deanna, Clay. First of all, let's step back a little bit and let's do some introductions. We don't always do those, and I feel like that's really helpful for our audience to get to know our team. So Deanna, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Deanna Emsley. I'm a senior director here at the Parker AP Group, and I've only ever worked in retail. Came from industry. I've spent about half of my career in industry, half my career in consulting, and primarily with focus on planning, supply chain, allocation, forecasting, et cetera. Awesome. Thank you. Hey there. I'm Clay Parnell. I'm the president and managing partner of Parker Avery. I've been here for about nine years. Uh, like Deanna, I've spent the dominant portion of my career in retail, either consulting or industry, mostly consulting. Um, early in my career, I actually spent some time in consulting and textile and apparel manufacturing, and then just kept working my way up the supply chain into retail. And I've been working in retail ever since. And I am Tricia Gustin. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing with the Parker Avery Group. Been here for a decade. Um, and prior to that, I was actually a consultant for the retail industry, worked with a couple of firms, IBM and Hewlett Packard. But now I focus on marketing with the firm. But let's jump into the content. And uh, today we're talking about business process transformation. And there's a lot of buzz about business transformation, but we want to focus on the business process transformation, really what that might include. Um, some challenges when retailers are doing it, what the interest is, and that type of thing. So the first question uh, we're going to start with is really kind of basic. And what is business process transformation? What, what does it mean and what might it include? I'd say it involves changing elements of your current business processes, either to meet changing goals or objectives or to respond to new market or competitive conditions. Yeah, and I think what I would add to that is what makes a process change transformative is usually that it's cross-functional as well, that it's not limited to a team in your organization, but it requires more than one team to all participate in the change in order for it to be transformative and successful. Is every change that comes across an organization or that they're trying to achieve, is every change in the way things are done a business process transformation? Definitely not. Yeah, definitely not. Like you think about, I'll just use an example, particularly as we've come through a pandemic and lots of things about purchasing inventory have changed. So a, a rational reaction to that in many of our clients has been the way that we approve POs needs to change. Who can approve them? What the thresholds are for those approvals? In some cases, they've tightened the screws down a little bit. In some cases, they've said, look, just make the best decision for your business. We don't have time for those approvals anymore. But that's not a business process transformation. For the people involved in that part of the process, it may feel very disruptive, very different, maybe even intimidating to be given a new authority you didn't have before. But that's not a business process transformation. Yeah, I, I agree. To me, transformational, in my view, it, it needs to be significant. It needs to be impactful. Uh, not just a small change. And I also think it needs to be a longer term change. Um, you know, like Deanna's examples, probably, hopefully, you know, shorter term changes uh, based on reacting to, you know, fairly unusual situations. When we talk about transformation, it's really not a siloed effect. It's, it's across the organization, across the enterprise. Um, what's the most common trigger? a business process transformation. Gosh, transformation. gosh that's hard. I, I think there there can be internal and external triggers. You know, internal, you may get new leadership. They've got a different idea. Maybe they want to change the strategy, um, you know, shake some things up. Maybe that's why they are hired. Uh, and certainly external, you, you know, people, are, our clients see competitive pressures. They see things happening in the marketplace. Certainly they see consumer trends, how they're shopping differently or what their, uh, their habits are, are changing out there. I know we've done, we've in the midst of quite a few of these business process transformation projects with Parker Avery, what, 
what functional areas or what processes are we seeing the most opportunities within our clients? And then some of the people that we're talking with in the industry, what are those process areas that are the kind of the focal point right now? Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. But, um, all of them. I mean, so, to some degree, our answer to that question is a little bit self-fulfilling because we have areas of expertise in the firm, of course. Um, certainly planning and buying and anything to do with the supply chain itself has required almost ongoing transformation over the last decade for a variety of reasons. Some of them are really positive reasons. There's more and more capabilities to make those decisions better, smarter, faster than there ever were before. And I don't see that ending soon. So that's a good and a bad news for those teams. And then of course, on the marketing side, anything that is directly customer facing. So I'm going to use the word marketing, but that can mean out in the fleet of stores, that could be your e-com channels, that could be all other touch points with your customer. Again, there are so many new technologies and processes and capabilities that too requires almost constant business process. And all of that requires cross-functional help. So that makes it transformative. How are those prioritized? So if it's always kind of everything's undergoing some sort of transformation, how does the, the most pressing ones bubble up to the top and say, we need to tackle this first? It's a great question. As you know, as far as priorities, you know, I think it's important to know what the the end game is. Um, we help a lot of our clients initially with what we'll call a, a rapid assessment and roadmap, and that helps them think through across the organization, cross cross functionally, as we're talking about. Um, if they're going to transform a part of the business, they may be thinking about you know moving faster, concept to consumer. Uh, they still have to spend some time thinking about where the biggest opportunities or the biggest challenges are and therefore what improvements can be done. Some of those may be short-term process changes. Uh, they could be long-term, very significant process changes. Uh, and then, of course, either of those could lead to some, some role implications and certainly some systems and, and IT capabilities they're looking for. But helping lay out that roadmap really helps the, the teams get aligned on what the priorities are and the relative sequencing. Yeah, and one of the things that makes it successful as a transformation is making sure that the new processes are quite elastic. So you don't find yourself in this constant, oh my gosh, it changed in, it changed again, what are we going to do? That is, is not a rabbit wheel that most people want to be involved in, and it causes a tremendous amount of turnover when they are. In the questions we, we talked about earlier, um, we talked about is it always tied to a new system implementation? And I know the answer is no. It's not always, we've pl helped plenty of clients, technology aside, manage through these business process transformations. Um, how is it different when you're not going through a system implementation? How does that look? I guess I'm talking about the Parker Avery's approach, right? We're gonna yeah. go in and, and the client says, we're bleeding here, help us I'm with business the process. the approach is that much different. We still very much come at it from a people process first perspective and where necessary, bring the third leg of that stool, which is tools and data into that fix. Um, I think one thing that's unique about a system implementation is it typically comes with a very hard and fast schedule. And, and so that requires a different level of engagement from the client team, from all the partners who've been brought in to assist that team. That may not be the case with a different type of transformation, which is a good and a bad thing. That lack of urgency and other types of transformation can cause unintended consequences. Sure. Yeah. I think the other thing about, you know, building on what Deanna shared, um, we do lead everything we um, do at Parker Avery from a business process or operating model standpoint. Um, and, and we do a fair amount of our process and transformational work, really just thinking about the business and, and maybe some role clarity, things like that before, or even in lieu of getting into systems and tools. And I think what that allows us to do and work with our clients is actually deliver some meaningful improvements and meaningful changes in a rapid and short amount of time. So we can, we can tweak some processes, we can deliver some training, we can update a, an integrated calendar, we can move things through from an improvement and immediate impact standpoint without having to wait for all the things that comes with a new system, data cleansing, conversion, integration, testing, training, all of those things. So if a client is listening, um, or prospective client, and they're 
trying to, this all sounds great. I want to change my processes. I want to get from point A to point you know, <laughs> Q uh, out in the future, much better than where I am right now. What does that look like? What it, lead me through Parker Avery goes through a process, business process transformation project at a high level. What are the steps to perform? Well, the first thing we do is we really want to assess where you are today and what objectives you think today's process and roles and responsibilities are really serving. And so the first thing we're doing is just trying to observe is the way you do things today actually yielding the outcomes you're saying to yourself it's supposed to be yielding. The next step is then to do a gap analysis very quickly against what good would look like for you. And I think really importantly, we are not a firm that comes with this one way of what right looks like. And we need you all, whoever all of you are, to all look the same. There's only one best practice and everyone needs to look exactly the same when they follow it. We're not that. We have a lot of experience. We have a lot of ways of defining what best practice can mean for you. And so that gap analysis is really, again, about saying, hey, client A, you need to be excellent in this area. You can be B plus over there though. And you don't, here's what excellent would look like, but we don't think you need to be excellent in that area. Client B, we may have a different conversation with you. And I think that's really, really important. And from that gap analysis, then we can prioritize, work obviously with the team to prioritize what needs to happen to close the gaps we've agreed exist and need to be closed and put a roadmap of track record to, together to do that. That, as Clay said, looks like crawl, walk, run. We're not a fan of a big gulp of change at once. That's often not adoptable. And we go from there. Sometimes we stick around to help you work through that roadmap. Sometimes we don't. I think that was that was a great response, that, that focus on our flexibility. And you know that, that really leads from our experience level and our ability to collaborate with our clients. Um, not to, to make a commercial here, but we were told recently uh, by a new client that we were awarded a significant project against a much larger competitor in large part because the client based on our discussions and you know uh, introductions and getting to know each other they told us they knew that we would work with them to complete the work not do the project to them and that sense of culture and collaboration made all the difference to them in, in selecting parker avery that's awesome. I'd love to hear that because I know how tight our culture is and that's that's really meaning meaningful for our team, certainly. And it's nice that it bleeds through through our clients. And the other thing, as you were talking, both you, Clay and Deanna, that we don't, it's not this high level process. Y'all are down creating meeting agendas, revising roles and responsibilities. You're down in the nitty gritty details of those processes. I mean, I know a lot of consulting, I'm not that trying to bash anybody, but it's all high level. And then the client's supposed to figure out what that high level means in realistic terms. We go down into those realistic terms yeah. and, and meeting agendas, um, how interactions between specific roles and everything are, are looked at and evaluated and redesigned in that business process transformation. You want to ex- expand on that just a little bit? Yeah, I think, again, this is going to sound like a broken record, but in order for something to be transformative, it has to stick. And in order for it to stick, it has to be adoptable. And that's, you don't get something adoptable by reading a PowerPoint from on, right. you know, another group who built you another PowerPoint and just walk back to your desk and do your job differently. That's That's not what adoption looks like. So yeah, it often sounds like you don't just need a new milestone that's called a hindsight meeting here in your process. Here's what a hindsight meeting needs to sound like. You need to be asking and answering these questions. Team A, your role in that discussion will be this. Team B, your role in the discussion will be that. And sometimes it's us diving in and and helping conduct that conversation as if we're part of your team for a little while until you get the hang of it. It's all about it being enthusiastically adopted. Otherwise it was all really not a waste of time. It's an interesting research expedition, but it's not transformative if we can't get it to be enthusiastically adopted. That's that's a great point. You know, going back to the question, we we really do like to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty with our clients. I think that's a lot of why the folks here at Parker Avery are, are here because we actually like doing the work that Deanna just described. Um, and you know, if I think about what makes some of these transformations and, and the work successful, there, there's a number of things you can list, but the two that I always come back to are kind of at the ones at the top and ones at the bottom. The very top 
is executive leadership and sponsorship. They're the ones that really have to set the vision and maintain that vision along the way. And at the bottom is, is, is exactly what Deanna described, which is understand the details in the effort, not just to do the transformation and lay it out, but to ensure it's adopted successfully and will be sustained. Both of those are, are just critically important. Ironically, our, our role is best executed when we walk ourselves out the door because we're not needed anymore. That, that's actually a really big badge of honor. If, if we've done our job to the degree that, gosh, you guys are fabulous, but I guess we don't need you anymore. That's a wonderful way of walking out the door. Yes. Let's talk about some of the biggest challenges. Um, and this, I guess, is sort of a change management conversation too, but when they're in the middle of this transformation and we're down in the details and we're talking about new meeting cadences and how team A is now going to work with team B and it's never been done before, how, what are some of those big challenges and how, are, how do we help them overcome those challenges? Great question. I think too, that I always highlight for my clients when we're getting started. One, one is a lack of clarity and roles and responsibilities especially when we're talking processes. Um, so who's accountable, who's responsible and the transparency across those, especially in a, in a cross-functional world. And that leads me to the, the second one, which I usually highlight, which is not thinking end to end, not considering end to end implications with, within retail, as we all know, thinking about merchandising and supply chain, so many processes are connected, you know, thinking about item definition, attribution, pricing, inventory movement, inventory management, all these things have so many touch points across the enterprise. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the other thing is a failure point sometimes can be this kind of check the box mentality. Oh, we, we were told we needed to change and have this meeting now, just sticking with that example. And then the meeting turns into the show and tell sort of reading the news to each other, but there's no new outcomes coming from that time being spent. That That's not acceptable. It, and it often comes from people being so afraid to make mistakes doing the new thing in front of each other. So a really important success factor has to be an open communication from the top down and often from the bottom up. What does failure look like together? And, and how are we gonna be open about taking some risks, making some mistakes, course correcting, and not being punitive as we all walk through this journey together. That's a great point. So on that line, kind of the flip side of the challenges, key success factors, like how do we know when we walk out that door and the client says, thanks, we don't need you anymore. We're good. We're rolling on our own. What are the key success factors to get to that point? Totally depends on what the work is, <laughs> but um, I'll start by saying a, a key success factor is when everyone agrees what we set out to accomplish how we've measured that and what that measurement has told us. I, I think that kind of rubric applies to almost every type of work we do in this space. Uh, getting more detailed about that really then starts to turn into a conversation about, well, what was the work? What, what exactly would success have looked like? Um, but beyond the things Clay added that were often about communication and transparency and being proactive, I think that momentum comes from everyone agreeing what are we trying to do? How are we going to measure whether we've done it or not? And using those measurements, where are we in getting to 100% complete right now? Yeah, yeah. I think the focus on value is important for the kind of work we do. We don't tend to get involved in projects just because clients are trying to cut costs and save money. Uh, sure, there's efficiencies involved, but we're. I think much of our work is, is, is focused on more of the effectiveness side. How do I make sure that Yes, I'm doing, I'm getting a better forecast, but what is that allowing me to do in planning and allocation replenishment? And along those lines, what do each of those processes and solutions allow me to do from a, a you know, inventory productivity standpoint turns, uh, as well as, you know, hitting sales and margins. Some of those things that are inherent to what our clients are focused on. But when you start building some of those value levers into the delivery of the effort itself, it, it does tend to get um, you know, a lot more appreciated by our clients. So if I'm a client or prospective client listening, I'm also going to say, mm, this sounds great. If I start one of these, what, what kind of time horizon am, am I looking at? If I, we start in August, are we going to be done 
August 31st? Is that is there is there a time range that we could say this is about what you'd expect? I know it's probably going to vary, but is there any kind of solidity we can put on that? Yeah, it, it really varies based on scope. I mean, the, again, the great thing about working in the business process area is you can establish some some clear milestones. So if we think we might start with a short assessment and roadmap piece, that in itself, you know, could be done in a matter of weeks. And then depending on the scope across merchandising, planning, fulfillment, uh, supply chain, et cetera, depending on the scope we're looking at, the, the process transformation work itself, you know, could be two or three months, could be five or six months or more. So it really just depends. And imagine once we get into those projects too, you start finding new things to, and, and it may be a bit of scope creep, but at the same time, it may be necessary scope creep because if you don't do this extra thing that you found out during the discovery, perhaps it's not, you're lessening your chances of success. Would that be a true statement? Yeah, I don't see that as scope creep as long as the way we handle those, that, that happens every time. <laughs> <We'll start with laughs> that. The, the way we need to be handling that, and we, we do habitually handle it in this manner, is to say, hey, as your partner, I want to also share with you this other observation I have. I'm not going to tackle that right now per our agreement. I'm going to stay focused on this thing, but I did notice this, and I wanted to bring that to your attention. We'd be happy to help with that too, but we're going to remain focused on this for now. Sure. And, and I, you know, that obviously gets everyone's skin in the game, but it would be unethical for us to turn a blind eye and say, mm, that's not my scope. I'm not going to look over there or talk about that or whatever. It's often very difficult to disconnect it all and do that anyway. Um, but it's similarly unfair to the firm to just tackle everything we see when we get there because <laughs> that doesn't make sense either. Any last pieces of advice for companies, retailers, CPGs who are, are contemplating, you know, kind of looking introspectively and saying, I need, I do need help. We need to transform our business processes. We don't know where to begin outside of Colin Parker Avery. <laughs> where could they start beginning down this journey? I guess I can start by saying one of the most powerful things about asking for help is you do get an objective, but experience-based set of opinions. And it would not only can we share those opinions, but we can also teach your organization how to make it safer to say those things to yourselves without us being there, which sometimes is the reason we're so helpful in the beginning is we sometimes have ideas that internally you had too, but it wasn't a safe enough place to push that idea further into action and disruption and ultimately transformation. And having an outside experienced industry partner come to the table and say, yep, yeah, that's not a crazy idea. Here are things we see elsewhere. Here are the lessons learned from those elsewheres. Let's see how we can roll up our sleeves and make this a safe and productive next step for you. There's a tremendous amount of value in that. And that can be a very short-term engagement or that we can be there for a long time with you. We have a lot of flexibility when you approach it from that mindset. Yeah, that's a great point. Sometimes <clears throat> there's a fine line between uh, what we view as our consulting role and what might just be a therapist role. Um, and, and working with some of our clients uh, and their you know, ability to feel safe and uh, really download you know, a lot of their thought process and uh, feelings in some of these discussions. Um, I think the other piece is you know, we have uh, clients that are very experienced with working with consultants and those that are, are very immature at doing so. Um, so you know, on one hand, we tend to get called by clients that know what they're looking for when they see opportunities that maybe they view as strategic or urgent or complex, and, and they know it's going to be transformational and they know they need help. Other times clients call us and they know that either something is painful or they think they're missing out on opportunities, but they're just not sure how to frame the challenge, the opportunity or what to do next. And, and those are the ones that as, as a Deanna mentioned, they may have some good ideas. They're, they're just not clear or getting the right insights of, okay, what do I do first? What do I do second? And that's where that assessment roadmap in a very short time period can, can help tremendously. All right, you two. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Talk Retail to Me and uh, great insights as usual. I love talking with my team on Specialty on Fridays. It's just a great way to wrap up the week and we'll see you again soon. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Thank Thanks. you. That's a wrap for this episode of Talk Retail to Me. If you have questions related to today's topic, please visit our website at parkeravery.com to learn more and to
contact us. Also, we'd love it if you shared Talk Retail to Me with any of your colleagues. It's streaming on all the major podcast platforms, and the videos are available on our YouTube channel. For more Parker Avery industry expertise and advice, be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.